All right, we'll hold you. We'll, we'll, we will, we'll try and make sure that we don't uh, force you into saying anything controversial. Yeah. Um, and then, so I'm also at this point, uh, I'm going to change the share protocol so that everybody can share. And um, that will allow the NYSERDA team to present information to us. And in the interim, what I'm going to do as usual is I'm going to mute everybody. And uh, I'm going to encourage you, please, uh, to use the chat function. If you have questions, you can send them to me. Um, and then, of course, I'm, I'm assuming that uh, Jen and Adam and Bill will, will stop periodically to, to see if there's anything pertinent that we need to address. Uh, but otherwise, I'm going to mute everybody now. And, um, and uh, we will go from there. All right, is everybody, uh, everybody ready to dive in? So, All right. Jen, take it away. Yeah, so I'm thinking I'm going to have approximately a... Oh, nope, sorry. I. What's that? No, I, I accidentally muted you and I muted everybody oh. else. Am I you're still good. muted? It doesn't look oh. like I am on my end. Oh, you're, you're good to go. Okay, good. <laughs> Yeah, so I think I'm going to have a, an approximately 30 minute or so presentation just trying to get out high level everything that I think you need to know about what's going on with clean energy in the state. Um, I apologize if some of it is stuff that people already know about. Um, I don't think we haven't really worked with the town of Newcomb before, so I figure this is sort of an introductory call to the clean energy siting team at NYSERDA, which is the team um, I'm on and Adam and Bill also and just what's going on at the state level. Some new things have been happening just in the last few months, even since we've been on, on lockdown. Uh, we have not stopped moving forward. So if at any point what I'm saying does not seem relevant or I'm getting too into the weeds, please just tell me to skip through a couple of slides. Also, a lot of them have a lot of words on them and it's not my intent for you to read all of them or even for me to read all of them, but it's more I can send it to you for reference after the fact. Thank so. you. With that said, I will go ahead and share my screen. How's it looking on your end? Good to go? Perfect. All right, Good to go. so like I said, I'm on the clean energy siting team at NYSERDA and our role is basically to act as advisors to local governments all across the state to help you prepare for clean energy development in your community, which I think is exactly what you asked me to come here tonight and talk about a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna go through some of the resources and stuff that we have to offer a little bit later, but first, uh, maybe one minute intro to PV systems. And I think I'm gonna be concentrating mostly on solar. I'm not gonna talk on wind too much because it tends to be really specialized in certain areas, but if that happens to come up in your town at some point, we can come back and do another one of these more focused on wind. But for the most part, you're more likely to be dealing with solar. So uh, there are three basic kinds, uh, residential and commercial rooftop solar, basically anything attached to a building could be on the roof. Some of them are, can even be integrated into the siding or other building materials, but these are relatively simple systems that are gonna collect the sunlight. Some of it will be used on site or in the building and some of it will be pushed back out into the grid. Uh, more recently, battery energy storage is becoming more popular. So this diagram here may include, you know, a battery at some point that the solar panels can charge and the home could use in case of a power outage or something like that. But this is the basic diagram of how it works. Uh, community solar, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but this is Basically for residents and businesses that maybe cannot put solar on their roof or on their property for one reason or another, or maybe they just don't want to, uh, what's been happening lately across the state is we're developing, developers are developing these pretty large scale, but not super large scale solar farms. So they're maybe taking up somewhere in the ballpark of like 10 to 50, like 10, 20 acres, somewhere in that ballpark. And Basically, homeowners and businesses can subscribe to get energy from those solar panels off-site without having to do anything on-site. And it's, it almost sounds too good to be true, but you can sign up for free. You end up getting a 10% discount on average um, for the electricity that you're getting from the farm. And that's pretty much it. It's very simple. You'll get a bill from that community solar farm but what you're paying for that energy ends up being 
less than what you're saving on your actual utility bill. So it's a win-win and we're seeing a lot of these start to pop up. So it might be something that you see in your community depending on what kind of land you have available and things like that. And then the third most common type of installation you might see is what we refer to as utility scale solar. And for these, we're talking more on in the ballpark of like 100 acres, sometimes even thousands of acres for the really, really big ones. And they're essentially, they function as power plants like you might normally be familiar with function. They're just feeding electricity into the grid for folks to use down the line. Okay, so a little background on a lot of different stuff that's going on at the state level. So our New York energy policy, we have the clean energy standard. If you're not familiar with that, it's a goal for us to have 100% carbon free electric grid by 2040. There are some other interim goals in there as well, like 70% renewable energy by 2030. Uh, it's funded through the Clean Energy Fund, which NYSERDA administers and develops programs around to spend that money. It's a 10 year, $5 billion commitment. And a lot of the things that are being funded under that are moving very quickly. We could talk about it for hours probably, but high level, we have very ambitious goals in New York and NYSERDA has all $5 billion to spend basically to try and make them happen. And if you haven't seen solar in your community yet, it's really just a matter of time before you do. So one of the ways that NYSERDA is, you know, spending that clean energy fund money and trying to help meet those goals is through our annual large scale renewables solicitation. So far, there have been three iterations of it in the years 2017, 18, and 19. This slide just shows like a snapshot of the projects that were awarded from that competitive solicitation. You'll notice there aren't too many uh, up in the North Country by you folks. And I, I have to assume it's just a matter of, you know, available land, the Adirondack Park is there, you have mountains, maybe not so much flat open space, things like that. But as you can see, there's a lot going on across the state. So on top of that competitive solicitation that's really aimed at those utility scale systems that I was talking about, which can basically be thought of as large renewable power plants. We also have our New York Sun initiative. And this is the funding that's gonna be going to buy down the cost of installations that are going on people's rooftops and maybe some of those community scale systems that I was talking about too. And there's a billion dollar budget for that. So again, a lot going on. If you haven't seen it yet, it's only a matter of time before you do. So it's good that you're thinking about it and getting prepared now. And then, with all of that renewable energy coming online, uh, people say, you know, the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. So in order to switch over to a vast majority of renewable resources on the grid, we need some sort of battery storage to make sure that we have energy when we need it, not just when it's being produced. So we also have some pretty high, uh, some pretty ambitious energy storage targets as well. And we're putting a bunch of money behind that. This is relatively new. So it's likely that you haven't seen any of this in town, but again, it's really just a matter of time before we start seeing it all across the state and we have incentives and resources to help local governments like yourselves get ready for it. And just for a little bit of scale, the uh, 2030 statewide energy storage target of 3000 megawatts, just to help you understand what that means, it's about the demand of 40% of the homes in the entire state. So it's mm. big, it's a lot. And I mentioned earlier that a lot has been going on even in the last few months when you might have thought we were taking a break. Uh, we were not. As part of the state budget in April of this year, the governor included a 30 day amendment. And that part of that was the Accelerated Renewable Energy Growth and Community Benefit Act. So that is a thing that we're implementing now. There were three main components of that. It created a brand new office of renewable energy siting. Uh, they're currently working to basically build that office from the ground up, hiring staff, things like that. And the purpose of that office is to replace the old Article 10 process for renewable energy systems. If you're not familiar with that, it's basically a state level permitting process for any energy generating facility greater than 25 megawatts. So large power plants, be it fossil fuel or renewables, if they were larger than 25 megawatts, they get permitted at a state level instead of at a local level. 
It was not designed for renewable energy systems. It takes like three to five years, maybe more for projects to get through. We would never be able to meet our goals if we stuck with that. So we created a brand new Office of Renewable Energy Siting that will permit those projects much quicker. They have a one year time frame from the time a project submits an application until it must be approved for all renewable energy projects. And for those that are sited on brownfields, landfills, other like former industrial sites, places like that, it's actually a six month approval time frame. So it's gonna greatly speed up the process. If you haven't heard about this or been keeping up with it at all, I uh, recommend checking it out. It's a very interesting development and still very much in the works. The rules and regulations haven't even been uh, put out yet. Uh, the third box, I guess, down at the bottom, the state power grid study and program is basically trying to figure out where on the grid there is a need to upgrade infrastructure in order to accommodate renewable energy. There are a lot of places in the state where there's adequate land and solar resources, and it would be a perfect spot to put solar or maybe wind, but there's nowhere to connect to the grid, or if they can connect to the grid, it's not to a high voltage power line. So that's what that uh, state power grid study and program is all about, upgrading our grid infrastructure to make sure we can accommodate all the renewable energy coming online. And the one in the middle that I think you might be most interested in, the build ready component of that act, basically directs NYSERDA to become a renewable energy developer for the first time. We're, we've never played that role before. We've always just been technical advisors and providing information resources and those financial incentives that I talked about on previous slides. Now, we're basically gonna be acting as a developer to target underutilized sites across the state. So like brownfields, landfills, abandoned commercial properties, former industrial sites, otherwise underutilized land that maybe the private sector is not interested in developing for some reason because there's some sort of headache associated with the site that they don't want to deal with, but it would otherwise be great. So NYSERDA is going through a process now to, well, A, set up the brand new program, right? We're developing it from scratch. It was just announced in April. Uh, but we're also actively looking for sites all across the state that might meet that, those criteria. So that might be something to think about in town if you have any sites like that. Um, we'd love to hear about it and explore them further with you. And of course, uh, a major component of that Build Ready program is working with communities to make sure that we're able to give you either payment in lieu of taxes agreements and or host community agreements, basically benefits, financial benefits to the community that would you know, be a win-win. NYSERDA and the state get their renewable energy and the town that's hosting the facility reaps some local benefits from it. So, uh, I guess I, I sort of skipped ahead to the slide that was actually explaining that. So, I will skip through that. Um, so, that's a lot is going on, clearly. That was just a small taste in the things that I sort of happened to work on NYSER has a lot more going on, but I'm sure it's hard for local governments to keep up with it all. So our team, the Clean Energy Siting team, our role is to help you do that. And one of the ways we do is through our guidebooks. We have a solar guidebook, a battery energy storage guidebook, and the beginnings of a wind guidebook as well. So I'd like to take you through just some of the resources that we have to offer. Uh, don't, it's definitely not going to cover everything. I just want to touch on everything enough so that you know what's out there and can reach back out if something is interesting and you want more information or to talk about it further. So I mentioned payment in lieu of taxes agreements before. Uh, we can help you with that. We have model templates for agreements. We can help walk you through the seeker process for solar. Um, probably most important for this group, number three on the slide here, adopting the first bullet, adopting a model solar energy law. We have a template that you can take and edit as you see fit, but it's a nice starting point so you don't have to pay a lawyer thousands of dollars to start drafting a solar energy law for you from scratch. You can take ours. Uh, you can take it or leave it. We're always happy to review any drafts you come up with and make recommendations. You're not obligated to take them, of course. So that, uh, we have a municipal solar procurement toolkit if the town itself is interested in getting some renewable energy for the municipal buildings, things like that. It has a model RFP, and I'll go into some of this in a little bit more detail later. Um, and finally, for permitting and inspecting, we have a unified solar permit. 
uh, and that's for those smaller systems, like typical residential, small commercial, rooftop, that sort of thing, smaller ones, it's a streamlined permitting process. And this is another one of those documents that your templates that you're welcome to adopt it as is, change it as you see fit. Uh, hundreds of communities across the state have adopted the unified solar permit with min minimal changes and, and seem to be happy with it. Our clean energy siting team has a web page where all of the stuff, all of the information in this slides and more is available for download. Our contact information is on there. The solar guidebook you'll see over on the left. And in that same menu, we have our energy storage guidebook, a, a page about siting for large scale renewables, a page describing different workshops and technical assistance that we can offer and sign up for our email list, all that good stuff. So I think for our purposes, you'll be most interested in the solar guidebook. I'm not gonna go through every one of these chapters, I promise you, but for reference after the fact, if you wanna look at the slide, it covers a lot, as you can tell. I think I have a copy here. It's relatively, oh, there we go. It's about an inch thick or so. <laughs> the Zoom background makes that hard to show apparently. Okay. So I'm going to go through a little bit of the solar energy law, just kind of skipping around and touching on some of the things that I think are most important or that you might think are most important. Uh, we think that the solar energy law template that we developed is, is good. Uh, a lot of communities have used it to adopt their own laws. It's all inclusive. It should cover everything that would ever be a concern about solar energy systems in town. My old boss, who's no longer at NYSERDA, he actually moved over to the new Office of Renewable Energy Siting, used to say that if you could find one thing that would be a concern about a solar system that is not included in our law, that he would buy you dinner. Um, I'm not prepared to make that offer to everyone on this call, but I guess if someone finds something, I will buy that person dinner, maybe. I'll take a trip up to the Adirondacks and visit you. <laughs> And again, it's flexible. There, there are parts in there that are specifically highlighted as you should edit this, like insert name of town here, but even where those parts aren't, you, you're free to download the Word version of it that we have right on our website and, and mark it up as you like and use it. These are the contents of the model law. Again, not even gonna go through all of these, just wanna touch on it and give you an idea of what's included in there. So we'll pull out like a few sections to just high level overview. And for this group, I think section two, the statement of purpose is actually relatively important because you're looking at your comprehensive plan, right? And so if you adopt a solar law with all these requirements and the comprehensive plan didn't say anything about it, it can make the solar law rendered like useless basically. So when you're going through your comprehensive plan and, and updating it, it'll be really important to take a look at the statement of purpose that you're gonna put in your models in your solar law and make sure that it aligns with language or at least doesn't conflict with language in, in the comprehensive plan. So these are some, this is a recommended statement of purpose that we have in the model law. You're welcome to use it. You're welcome to change it, add stuff, whatever, but it's a, it's a starting point. We, for definitions of different types of solar systems, we've in the model law divided them up into three tiers. Tier one is anything basically that's on a building, on the roof or on the side. Relatively streamlined permitting process for those things. They're pretty simple. They're all over the place, relatively non-controversial. You know, They're not uh, in a farm field where it's gonna upset neighbors to look at it. It's just you know part of your roof. Pretty easy. Tier two solar energy systems are still relatively small, designed for on-site consumption, but they're ground mounted. People might think it is perhaps a little bit of an eyesore or something like that. So the, the requirements for those systems on the, in the model law are a little bit more strict than the ones for tier one. They have to jump through a couple more hoops, which makes sense. And then finally, tier three, which is Anything that doesn't fit one of those two easier to permit definitions, those really large scale systems are gonna, that's what the vast majority of the law is focused on regulating those. And so you'll see that we focus on those a little. So just some photos to give you an idea of what the different tiers look like. Tier one, building integrated, roof mounted, 
And if you take a look at the picture on the bottom, it's not really size dependent. As long as it's on a roof, it should be simple. Even if it's huge, like, I don't know what that is. It looks like a distribution center of some sort. But we would still consider that tier one because it's on a structure that's already there. Mm -hmm. Tier two, what they might look like. These are uh, residential systems just in someone's side yard. And then tier three, those really large utility scale systems. A few examples. And I've brought this up a couple times already, but it doesn't hurt to always drive it home that brownfields, landfills, and other repurposed lands are, generally speaking, great places to put solar and relatively non-controversial. So just a couple photos of those. Just to give you a taste of the types of requirements that are in the law. So for those tier one roof mounted systems, it'll say things like on pitched roofs, you want the panels to be perfectly parallel to the roof and not too far off it. So relatively close to it, eight inch max. These are things that you can edit, but we have recommendations in there. On flat roofs, you don't want it sticking up above the parapets. They should all have anti-reflective coatings to avoid glare. Almost every single solar panel that you could find on the market is gonna have those anyway, but it doesn't hurt to have it in the law. For those tier two systems, you'll see the glare requirement again. You get into a little bit more screening and visibility might be an issue. So if that's a problem, you might have some sort of requirement to put planters around it to obscure the view from a neighbor or something like that, reasonable things. Uh, we start getting into lot size requirements and height restrictions. You can, you have options here of subjecting the height restriction to match the underlying zoning for accessory structures. That's one path you could do. You could also follow our height limitations, which are in the model law, their suggestions. So those options are in there. Uh, setbacks, generally speaking for these, we recommend just using setbacks for the underlying zoning district. For those tier three systems, uh, if you look on the, the right-hand side of this slide, they get into some of the same things, but also a lot more detail and restrictions on them. And I'm not gonna go through all of them in detail. We'll pull out a couple, but uh, there's a process for approval outlined. It's relatively straightforward. Again, you can change it to meet the needs of your community and however you're functioning. Uh, over on the right-hand side of the screen, there are requirements for burying utilities like underground wires, things like that to the extent possible making sure vehicle paths are rel as narrow as they possibly can be while still being able to access the site, not taking up too much space, having appropriate signage. There's the glare issue again. It addresses lighting just to make sure that the systems only have the amount of lighting necessary for safety on site. You don't want this thing lit up like a showcase in town for everyone to see all night long. That would be bad. Uh, there are suggestions for minimizing tree cutting in there. Uh, decommissioning requirements, what needs to be in a site plan application, special use permit standards, and what to do if there are ownership changes. So I'm just going to pull out a couple that I think are most important. One is decommissioning. So what's going to happen to these systems at the end of their useful life? Are they going to get taken down? Are we going to get stuck with them? Um, so we put a requirement in there before it even gets built. You need to, they need to send you a decommissioning plan, including the cost, and how it's gonna get decommissioned. And we even recommend requiring a financial security mechanism of some sort, so that in the event, in the very unlikely event, that the project owner skips town, leaves the system there to rot 30 years from now or something, the town will have money available to it to do the decommissioning itself. It's, again, almost a non-issue, but to be safe, it's a good thing to do. Okay, and for those the special use permit standards, just a snippet of the stuff that's in there. It's kind of similar to the tier two stuff we talked about. There are uh, lot size tables in there. Again, you can reference the underlying zoning district or we have recommended lot size requirements that you're welcome to use. Same is true for the height of those systems and the setbacks for those systems. We have calculation methodology in there for lot coverage if you wanna have specific lot coverage requirements in certain districts. All of these things are covered. And uh, perhaps one of the most important things for these larger tier three systems that people tend to get a little bit up in arms about is what they look like 
to all the neighbors and anyone who's driving by. So there are screening and visibility requirements in there for the smaller size systems, less than 10 acres. It's perhaps a, a bit less arduous than those larger systems. And there are ways to deal with this. Like, first of all, siting systems in a, in a place that already has some natural buffering. But when that's not possible, you see in the picture on top there, it looks like some new trees were planted around it that over the years will grow up and, and shield it from view and people walking or driving by might not even know it's there. And of course, there's also suggestions in the law for how to deal with protecting agricultural resources, very important. Uh, you'll notice the, the sheep in the picture on the bottom, this is becoming more and more popular, I think. Uh, we've heard that it's actually cheaper to use sheep to mow the grass under the panels than it is to use typical lawnmowers and things like that. So it's kind of a win-win. The sheep farmers get a way to feed the sheep relatively cheaply. Uh, the, the solar system owner gets some ground maintenance relatively cheaply. And if you're, you're planting the right sorts of things under there, including you can plant pollinator species and have bees on site that can help neighboring farms and things like that. But all these things are, are really win-wins. Um, we don't recommend using goats because they'll jump on stuff and chew the wires, but sheep seem to be a good option. Uh, this is, this is not part of the, the model law per se, but just another important thing that you should be considering when talking about how to prepare for solar in town is New York State Real Property Tax Law 487. Uh, what this does is by default provides a 15 year real property tax exemption for renewable energy systems. Now, jurisdictions across the state are able to opt out, proactively opt out of this. We don't recommend doing that because generally speaking, full taxation on a solar project will make it uneconomic and then it won't be built. But if you do not opt out of real property tax law 487, you are able to enter into payment in lieu of tax agreements, which you can actually negotiate up to the full amount of what the taxes would have been. The likely scenario is if you tried to go up to what the taxes would have been, like I said, it would make the project uneconomic, but it's a way for the town to get revenue um, that it otherwise wouldn't have gotten because the project wouldn't be built otherwise, right? And it's, it's also important to note that you can't opt out of 487 just for, for example, large commercial systems. When you opt out of real property tax law 487, it makes every type of renewable energy system fully taxable including residential installations. And I know just in the last few days, I've had uh, residents from, well, at least one resident from across the state emailing and sort of upset that she was slapped with an increased property tax bill from her town for a residential energy system. And that's just no good for anybody. So these are important things to consider. And we have a toolkit to help you deal, assuming you do not opt out of real property tax law 487 and are interested in negotiating pilots for those larger projects. Again, recommend keeping the smaller ones, just let them ride tax-free so that folks can put solar on their roof without having to worry about it. But for the larger ones, we have a pilot toolkit. Uh, it includes a model pilot resolution where you can outline exactly which kind of projects you want to negotiate pilots with. Uh, we have a model agreement uh, calculator to help you determine them. And also, a property tax calculator because there are still some taxes that are going to be fully assessed on these systems even if you you don't opt out like fire district for example is always going to have to be paid so you need some way to assess the systems and uh adam who is on the call with us today is sort of our local pilot guru so if any of those questions come up later i'm going to probably ask him to step in for us and I know you guys were interested in hearing about, you know, of municipal procurement options. There are a few different ways you can go about it. One of them is directly purchasing a system. We actually don't recommend that municipalities directly purchase solar systems for their use because there are tax benefits that you would not be able to take advantage of if you did that. Uh, if you go toward a third party ownership where some other party owns the system and you're just sort of purchasing the power from it, it can be a lot cheaper because the developers are able to claim tax credits that you would not otherwise be able to claim. And then you don't have to deal with 
maintenance and upkeep and that sort of thing. An even easier option and way to make a little bit of money for the town would be if you have available land, you can just lease the land to a developer and they can do with the electricity, you know, what they will, depending on what kind of, like how high your energy rates are for the municipality, that actually might make the most sense. If you already have super cheap electric rates, maybe you don't even need to go the third party ownership route and you can just lease your land, you're doing something great for solar and bringing in a little revenue. It really all depends on your local situation, but the high level, those are the options. And we do have a municipal solar host toolkit as well. There's a template RFP in there, template lease agreement, uh, another uh, solar law for counties uh, that would not affect you, but it's available. Okay, so I'm going through it all pretty quickly, which is great because I know you're probably going to want to ask questions. I mentioned battery energy storage very briefly earlier. It's a little bit newer for everyone. It's also a little bit newer for us. I tried to show you how thick the solar guidebook was earlier. So we'll see if you can tell the battery energy storage guidebook is much thinner right now. Uh, we've had it out for maybe a year, a little over a year at this point, uh, but we're working on it and it does exist. I'm gonna skip through that one uh, at the moment. It's a, it's a little smaller. You'll see there's only four chapters compared to the solar guidebook, which I think had 11 or 12 somewhere in there. It includes a model law, much like our solar law, where you can customize it as you see fit, but it's a great starting point. Uh, we also have a model permit for those smaller battery energy storage systems that might be in a residence or a small commercial building, much like that streamlined solar permit where it's just sort of an easy check the boxes, do the things, it's approved. There's an inspection checklist also for those smaller systems your code official could use to help them do inspections. And then finally, that last chapter, which is labeled the 2019 Energy Storage System Supplement, it's basically the fire code. Um, since that supplement came out, the, there, we have the 2020 code. We just haven't updated the guidebook yet. We're in the process of doing it, but it's pretty much all of the same requirements. The, the biggest concern that we've heard from everyone and it is, a, is a real concern everywhere about battery energy storage systems is their fire safety and the, the potential for explosion if something goes wrong. So we are proud that New York State has the most stringent fire code in the country. In fact, that 2019 energy storage system supplement is a version of the 2021 international fire code that we adopted as an emergency ruling in 2019 to make sure that New York State on a statewide level is covered for these systems and has the most strict fire safety standards there are to alleviate some of those concerns about fire and explosion hazards and all of those things. I could literally spend two hours or more talking about fire safety for energy storage systems. And in fact, I have. Uh, I think we even have a recorded webinar if you're interested in learning more about that, but we do not have time today, but suffice it to say that we have a great fire code and there's a copy of it in the guidebook if you would like some light uh, bedside reading at some point. And just to give you an idea of what these systems look like, uh, a typical residential battery pack might be about the size of a suitcase hanging on a wall. So that's like the picture on the left side of the screen and the upper right hand corner. They might be located in a garage or outside the home on a wall somewhere, uh, not, in, not in living spaces. Um, and then those two pictures in the middle are what might be, you know, a small to mid-sized commercial system located in a basement, the size of a refrigerator or perhaps a few refrigerators next to each other, that general ballpark. Uh, and much like solar, we've divided these into tiers. So tier one was a smaller one and the model law sort of deals with them a little bit differently. And uh, tier two systems, the larger, more utility scale battery energy systems that you might see coming online uh, can be the size of shipping containers or multiple shipping containers like in that upper right hand photo. So much bigger, very energy dense. There are a lot of nice strict safety requirements uh, in that fire code, the state fire code that I was just talking about, and also in the in the model law with how to deal with them. Okay, so that's the end of my prepared slides. 
I hope I did not overwhelm. Uh, I just wanted to give you a taste of all the things we're dealing with and the resources that, that we have and we can continue the conversation right now and in the future. <laughs> Thank you, that was yeah. fantastic. Right. So um, I have a, a, a list of questions that, uh, that, you, that you've prompted, um, but I'd, before, um, I'd like to open it up to, to, the, to the team to ask questions. Before I do that, I, I did just want to ask, um, you mentioned buying us dinner uh, and or whoever finds something that's omitted in your plan. Um, I'd like to start with a, with a very sincere and very serious invitation um, for you to come up and we'll buy you dinner. Um, and I say that because uh, we're not interested in picking apart the book and seeing what's missing. We're really interested in having you come into our town and do some site assessments. We have some pretty interesting properties in our town, um, some privately owned, some municipal, uh, that I do think present options that we would very that we'd be very interested in working with NYSERDA and looking at um, both funding opportunities as well as planning. So I'd, I'd like to start by putting that out there and, and you and I can follow up separately about that, but um, absolutely having you come up um, and the team, sure. obviously, Adam, Bill, you as well, both of yeah. you as well. Um, have I, I doubt if we were going to be doing a legitimate, I appreciate the offer, first of all. And second of all, I wouldn't be able to let you buy me dinner because it's against our code of ethics or whatever, but I'd be happy to have dinner with you that I paid for. <laughs> Excellent. But, we can arrange that. Yes. Uh, for If we were actually looking, going on sites and doing site assessments and things like that, we'd probably be bringing in, you know, an engineering firm or something like that. It, it wouldn't be me. But to the extent that you have sites and you could put them down in, in writing and send them over, we can put them in the queue, most likely for that that build ready effort that I was talking about that sort of puts nicer in the shoes of a developer. And if they appear to be sites that would not be otherwise desirable to a private developer, we can certainly take a look at them. I didn't mention this, but we're generally looking at sites 65 acres and larger. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, but to the extent that you have smaller ones or, or larger ones that perhaps aren't those brownfields, landfills, underutilized sites, we can always give you direction for how to reach out to the private sector and get them involved because we're not trying to take work away from them. We're only trying to get to the sites that they don't want to deal with for one reason or another. And so thank you. That, that, that's exactly what, we're, what I think we would be looking for is, is having you look at a couple of different sites and then give us guidance on what you think the best fit might be for those sites. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thanks. And a lot of it right. will depend on you know, the availability of interconnection to the grid. I'm not sure. Yeah. I did not look at the hosting, grid hosting capacity maps before this. I probably should have, um, but yeah. But to the extent maybe you have a lot of sites and there's no great place to interconnect with the grid, that's something that we'd also want to know to help inform that power grid study and program. That is exactly what I wrote down was the yeah. power grid study. Yeah. That's actually, to me, there, there's a, a series of strategic initiatives that we want to advance in our town and being part of that study would be key to it. So we can talk separately about that in more detail. Yeah. All right, so I'd like to open it up to um, questions. Uh, so I can, I can now see everybody who is projecting. Um, if you are interested, if you have a question, please either raise your hand um, or in some other way, let me know, and I will begin to move through and um, and field those questions. I'm going to unmute everybody, so it's now going to be the wild, wild west. Um, some of you have muted yourselves. Um, my controls are off, so if you are still muted, you need to unmute on your end. Um, and again, as always, please manage the sounds in the background of your home so we don't cut in um, audio, cut audio in and off um, on others. All right, Mary Lamphere, I see you lit up. Oh, I did. I, I have a question and, and maybe really an ignorant question, but I've been getting a lot from NYSEG lately wanting me to get and um, adopt their solar program. So how does that all fit in with, you know, I'm sure other people are also getting those messages. So I think we're talking about two different things, but... Perhaps. Um, to be, 
To be honest with you, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. I'm sure certain it's not an ignorant question. There is a lot going on that I don't even know about, even though perhaps I should with what the utilities and even sometimes other agencies or even within NYSERDA. What, what exactly is it that they're, they're asking you to get on board with? With the solar program. So I'll have to get that information to you, Paul, and then maybe sure. you can escalate it up and see exactly well, in comparison. I think that I, I think that the, the key thing to be thinking about is that NYSIG is a provider and they're trying mm -hmm. to sell you a product. Mm -hmm. And NYSERDA is a regulatory and planning agency and they're interested in helping us think about, um, well, obviously how we plan our energy system. So, okay. I, so I think to some degree, it's, it, it's in a way unrelated in that they're trying to get you a product. But I think understanding what that product is, where it comes from, um, I think that would be beneficial. And I think we certainly should look at those things and who else has ideas for our town. Yes. Okay. So you're saying NYSEG's been reaching out to you like as a homeowner saying, right. hey, we have renewable energy. If you'd like yeah. to pay a little extra, you can get it. Okay. Yeah. I, for some reason, I wasn't even thinking that. It's, it's not a silly question at all. But I would... What they're offering is most likely legitimate. Uh, there are also other options. Yeah. I mean, you, you have the choice where you get your energy from. You can go with the utility provider and use their renewable energy option. Sometimes it ends up being a little bit more expensive. Sometimes maybe mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, other options, if there's a community solar project nearby you, sort of what I briefly touched on earlier, you have the option to subscribe to that. There are also third-party energy providers where you could choose to purchase their, their renewable energy. There, it, it, is, it is kind of a lot to sift through. I can understand why you have that question. It's okay. not totally Thanks. my expertise, though. Thank well, you, and Adam, Mary. if you happen to know any more about that, feel free to jump in or okay. have advice. Thank you, Mary. So I've got, I've got Wes next. If you're interested, um, again, if you have a question, please shoot something to me in the chat or raise your hand or use your on-screen reaction, the clappy hand, the thumbs up, whatever, and I'll, I'll know to get you next. Wes. Oh, you're muted, Wes. Here we go. Huh. Try again. Thank you, he's unmuted. You're showing, you're showing unmuted, but I'm, Wes, say something. Uh, no. Mm. Uh, hmm. If you want to write the question into the chat box, maybe able to answer it that way. I think I got it. Ah, you got it. Yeah. Yep. There it is. Uh, to Mary and the group, I would be extremely cautious of, um, uh, of, Dialing into ESCOs, and that's what um, is an option through NYSEG. The cheapest power that you're going to get is going to be through NYSEG and not NYSEG Solutions or any other um, shoot off or spin off from that. Um, I can give you personal experience of how to pay 12 cents a kilowatt hour when you should be paying five. And so, um, Feel free to investigate that, but no, uh, I can do that because okay. I'm from ambient days. But I just um, yeah. for some of the clarification, what what we're talking about with what maybe people are receiving in their mail. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's I think it's NYSEG's obligation in order to move that along, um, just like it's NYSEG's obligation to um, to support and buy energy from companies that generate it. Um, at a much higher rate per kilowatt hour than what they buy it for or they, they manufacture it for. And um, the legislation connected with, electri uh, with electricity is, um, uh, it, it would be a very interesting topic for you to research on your own. Yeah. All right, thank you both. That, that's um, great advice. I would, I would say, however, that the, the community solar projects that are starting to pop up are actually legitimate and you can actually save money. I signed up for one myself. It's not a 10% off your entire electric bill, but for the portion of my electric bill that's tied to that community solar project, saving approximately 10% or so 
on that energy. And if, if you're ever approached about one of those and have a question about whether or not it's legitimate, NYSERDA supports all of those community solar projects and we have some pretty strict rules for how they have to go about recruiting customers and the benefits yeah. they offer them. And we have a list of those community solar projects on our website if you ever mm -hmm. wanna check and make sure it's legitimate. Mm -hmm. uh, just throwing that out there. Not the same as the offers coming directly from, from NYSECO. I, I would just contend that the benchmark for this is if you buy energy directly from NYSEG, who is our transmission and supplier, mm -hmm. to look at the rate per kilowatt hour that you're paying and then make decisions on a comparable basis for other alternatives that are out yes. there. That's all. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100% agree. <laughs> I'll tell you where you'll end up. Yeah. All right. So um, I'd like to, to know uh, if uh, people have any questions about the presentation this evening. Mary, um, Mary Monahan. Yes, I have a question. Uh, uh, what, one moment, please, Mary. Yes. Is someone? Uh, um, whoever... George had a question, but I'm sorry. I've got a really bad connection to Zoom right now. So. Okay. Um, I'll, so I've got Mary Monahan, Debbie. I'll come back to George in just a moment. Okay. Thank you. Mary, go ahead. Okay. My question is the difference between Tier 2 and Tier 3. Is it possible to start off at Tier 2 and add on, but then cross over to Tier 3 and end up in a different category? Or are you limited? Tier 2 is, straight, is really this structure upon itself so many and tier three is a completely separate structure in other words you start off tier two and you want to add a few more add a few more add a few more and add uh, end up in a tier three situation does that make a difference in how you're handling it yeah inter interesting question um i would say it's fairly unlikely but it is possible um the, the only situation I can really think of where that might happen is perhaps on a, a farm, maybe, where they have a tier two system because it's designed to meet the on-site power demand for the farm, which also makes it a lot easier to get permitted in an ag district because it's considered on-farm equipment at that point. But say they decide they don't want to farm anymore and they want to start leasing the land out for a large scale utility solar system, you could end up going into tier three at that point. I don't know personally of any examples where that's happened. It would be certainly a unique situation. So if that ever comes up for you, I'd be very curious to be involved and in, in see how it plays out, but not common, I don't think, to be for individual projects to be jumping to, from tier two to tier three like that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Debbie and um, and George. Go ahead, George. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yep. All right, good. Uh, I work for the town of Newcomb, small town of what, 800 people? 450. You know, uh, at best. We have some sites that lend themselves well to uh, solar reception. And I applaud the uh, work that NYSERDA has done because I've been familiar with you guys for the last 10, 12 years. Um, oh, your insights into clean energy have been invaluable. Right now, we're in the process of trying to explore sites for solar uh, energy. We have maybe three or four in town here and uh, I'm trying to convince our supervisor that there are a number of vendors that will take care of all the engineering work for us and present the engineering analysis to the town board for our evaluation. I'm somewhat fluent with solar energy. We have solar panels in our house. We know how they work. We know what we get from them and so forth. Uh, I know about Southern locations and so forth. Uh, but we have very limited number of uh, locations where we can put solar panels and our town do. Oh, 
I think you guys accidentally went on mute. Hey, Debbie and George. I think either your connection froze. All right. Uh, it looks like they got muted again, or muted, yeah, maybe they're... accidentally muted themselves. Yeah, they're not on. They're. It's not on a control level on my end. I can't unmute them. No. It's on their end. Yeah. George, um, your video is frozen on the getting bits and pieces, so it, you may be able to still hear us. If you can still hear us. Um, I would encourage you guys to maybe disconnect and reconnect um, and certainly check your mute function. Yep. Um, I think maybe I know where that was going, so I'll do my best to try to address it a little bit, but it sounds like that's a, a perfect, that issue is a perfect candidate for perhaps our municipal solar procurement toolkit. And I think what, uh, I already forgot his name already, I'm horrible at that. George. Because <laughs> it's not on the screen. Um, it's George. It's I, what he was saying about like the town would not need to be doing their their own engineering assessments or anything like that. You can certainly get a developer to come in, do all that stuff for you, and present it to the town. It would should be relatively simple and straightforward. Other questions that members had. Um, I'm going to, to ask one, please. Um, in, in relation to the power grid analysis and also the battery storage, um, in looking at the projects and reflecting on your comment that there really isn't much in the, in the, in the park, uh, and in particular, I noticed in Essex County, there weren't any. Um, is, there a, is there some recognition and encouragement to have solar and renewable production and storage spread uniformly around the state or are they trying to target developments uh, in major metropolitan um, and municipal areas? The grid is not my specialty. So take this with a grain of salt, especially for the recording <laughs> purposes. <laughs> but I would say in the, in the near term, especially for battery energy storage, we're probably targeting the more highly densely populated areas because that's where the grid is sort of overloaded and needs some of that additional capacity that batteries can provide. But in the long term, I think we're looking at not having, in the very long term, maybe not even having super large centralized power plants anymore. So in the future, I can imagine a scenario in which there's locally produced renewable energy and battery energy storage, maybe not evenly distributed throughout the state, but according to population and demand, of course. So I don't know if that answers your question. It, it does. And, and the reason I'm asking, I'm asking because I'm trying to align several pieces. First and foremost, how, um, how likely would we be to, be to have a proposal of ours funded, right? So what's our competition? What are the priorities within any kind of funding decision making? But uh, the the way in which I'm interested in trying to elevate our attractiveness to receive funding is to highlight that because we are so rural and so remote, we have probably per capita amongst the highest rate of power outages of anywhere in New York State. So in terms of trying to stabilize the power system, we would love to see some kind of local power generation, some kind of local battery backup so that our community would then be um, reliably powered uh, throughout the year. Uh, whether uh -huh. we're drawing off the grid or whether we're having redundant power through um, through alternative and renewable energies. So really my question is about what kind of competition are we facing and going after either the build ready money, um, even as a project prioritization, um, what, uh, what opportunity do we have to be written into the power grid uh, program in order to try and secure funding to reestablish what is now um, a, a unfortunately dismantled um, three phase power um, uh, that used to be a power supply and, and we'd love to see reestablished because we could put up, we've got 1500 acres that could be a solar farm. Wow, okay, no, that's, that Ooh. is, um, yeah, that's something that I would like you to send me after the fact. I'm not directly working on the power grid study, to be honest with you, I'm not sure exactly how they're doing the analysis, but sure. I can okay. get the information. <laughs> to folks who can get the information to the right folks who actually are working on that study. Um, 
other than that, I, th I may have misrepresented uh, the funding situation a little bit because I don't think it's necessarily that you would be competing for funding. And especially on that map that showed all of the large scale solar projects, that funding is going or will be going if the projects get built and are operational, will be going to the project developers. Like there's nothing um, about the, the towns or whoever that isn't that's not why the North Country is empty. I'm assuming there just aren't, weren't good, great places to put projects there for one reason or another. So the developers were not successful or didn't even propose projects to begin with. So it wouldn't be the town competing for that funding. For the smaller scale projects like residential and those community solar projects, the smaller ones that I was talking about, that's not even competitive. It's just set incentive levels. Do install the energy and you, you get a discount basically. And for the build ready program, we're not, you're not really competing for incentives either. We're trying to take in as many sites as is possible for us to get developed. If they're not of interest to NYSERDA for some reason, they might be of interest to a private developer. It's not really fund funding per se that you'd be competing for outside of any pilot agreements or host community agreements that would accompany the project itself. So I just wanted to try to clarify that a little sure. bit. Thank you. Yeah. Um, other questions from committee members about anything related to the to the solar conversation. Wow. Yeah. I'm amazed. Yeah. Well, just um, in general, I would say before you start getting permit applications for solar projects in town, especially the slightly larger ones. You might be able to handle residential permits without having a, a law in the books, although we do highly recommend it, that and the unified solar permit. It's important to try to get a law in the books and be prepared in advance. And when you're updating your comprehensive plan, try to get some language in there that will support whatever future law you adopt. Those are sort of the, the take homes. Even at the, that state level say, uh, permitting process that I was talking about, it used to be done under what's referred to as Article 10. Now it's going to be done through that Office of Renewable Energy citing any projects over 25 megawatts. Technically, through that process, the state has the ability to issue a permit, uh, technically regardless of what the local law says. But uh, there is an opportunity for municipalities through that state permitting process to say, hey, this project does not comply with our local law and here's the part of our local law that it does not comply with. Take this into consideration. If you do not have a local law, you have nothing to point to. So even at the state level uh, permitting process, it's important to have a local law in the books. And of course, at the local level for permitting, it's much easier for you and everyone else if you have a law that outlines what needs to be done to get one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so one of the, the other questions that I had, I mean, I, I know we, you, we, we kind of bounced back and forth about dinner and, 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 and state obligations not to allow us to pay for dinner. Uh, but sincerely, how do we stay connected with, uh, with you? And uh, when I say you, I don't necessarily specifically mean you, because I appreciate you said that, you know, for different questions we have, there may be someone else within NYSERDA who has a, yeah. who has a, 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 more, a more direct focus on particular things. But how do we stay in touch with NYSERDA in order to make sure that uh, we're aware of opportunities and how to be connected in order to, like, for example, developers who are looking to site battery programs? We have no idea how to solicit them, identify them, bring them to our town. But it seems as though you guys might be. Um, so, uh, and the comments, uh, my comment about competing for funding, I mean, can, our projects in our town, I, I didn't necessarily okay. mean that we would be funding them, but we want to find developers who want to do this kind of work. How do we find those developers? How do we make sure their projects are successful? So um, I'm hopeful that it's appropriate to stay in touch with the three of you on those questions. Yep. You're more than welcome to reach out to any of us individually. We also have a catch-all email, which I know people tend to be a little bit nervous about sending emails to quote unquote generic email addresses, but Ours, cleanenergyhelp at nyserta.ny.gov, fairly easy to remember, will go to me, it'll go to Adam, it'll go to Bill, and like three or four other people that are on our team or in the New York Sun program, it shoots the email off to all of us at the same time. And then we decide who is best to tackle the issue. 
And we can usually turn around some sort of response within 24 hours. So don't be afraid to use that clean energy help email address. You actually have a, a better chance of getting someone to respond quickly versus maybe a send an email to me and I'm on vacation for a week or something like that. You'll be hitting all of us if you send it to that one. But you're That's welcome great. to hit us, reach out to any of us individually at any time, email, phone, yeah. whatever. Thank you. And yeah. um, that's clean, clean energy help at nicerta.ny.gov? Yep. Okay. Thank you. I think that's actually what I used after I talked to Frank on the phone. It was actually. See, and yeah. here we are. Yeah, <laughs> it worked out, worked out pretty well. Yeah. Uh, nicerta.ny.gov. All right. Um, so, committee, I don't know if you guys had too hearty a 4th of July weekend or what's going on, but I am impressed that everyone is, um, is as quiet as they are. So, uh, last opportunity uh, before we segue to other aspects of our meeting, do you guys have any questions for Adam or Bill or Jen about any of the material that was covered tonight or about uh, things we've discussed that are pertinent to, to Newcomb? Uh, Wes. Okay. Um, I think this is another case of, um, there's a lot of information there. There's a lot of things to consider. Um, I definitely um, know that we need to um, go with Jen's recommendation to either have a local law or incorporate uh, what our strategy is into zoning. Uh, as it relates to these different phases of uh, solar power. Um, you know, I, I think that the members of the committee, even though tacit, um, have an idea as to the three phases of approach for solar energy and have ideas of places in town that it potentially could be um, at least considered and so, you know, as a result of our future planning objectives, we need to, um, you know, put this on the list. You know, we may need to revisit this again in order to kind of sharpen our pencil a little bit. Uh -huh. um, but it certainly is another topic that uh, merits um, strong consideration as we go to put the plan together. And, and it's and it's in a line, you know, Paul, you always like dial into the funding. It's it's in alignment with what the stated state objectives are. And so, you know, as we have witnessed in the past, um, our ability to identify with those objectives and deliver upon them brings us funding. And this is another opportunity in order to make ourselves rich um, just off of our intellectual capital. I, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Kirsten, go ahead. Well, I just had uh, one quick question is, should we also be thinking about wind energy? You, you mentioned that briefly at the beginning, but sort of focus more on solar. Is there any interest in that or any reason for that? So I, there's a couple of things. I mean, I, the, the answer for me is always uh, absolutely, and we should not limit ourselves in our thinking um, on, on any levels. There are some practical realities with wind um, because of park agency. Uh, and there's also some issues. We've done some wind studies uh, and there's also some, uh, some challenges actually with, uh, with supply here. Uh, in fact, the, the windiest point in town is the mine. Um, so uh, there's, I think there's opportunities and, and actually uh, Jen, Bill, uh, Adam, I'd ask you to talk to this. A number of years ago, I did some research on micro wind. So uh, like six foot turbines, you can run down the ridge line of your home. Uh, is that, that seems to have disappeared. Um, also vertical axis turbines and all kinds of other stuff. Um, are people do, still doing that work or is really everything shifted at least on the, has wind really shifted towards a uh, large scale and, and, and homeowner is just not happening anymore? I have not heard of any of the smaller stuff happening lately. That doesn't mean it's not, like I said, there's so much going on that maybe I'm missing something, but it seems to be shifting more toward the utility scale wind farms. And in fact, the turbines themselves, even on that scale are getting bigger and more efficient too. Yeah. All right. That's the best I got, <laughs> unless someone else um, yeah, has Just to yeah. jump in, yeah, I would agree with that. And something else too is that residential solar um, and things that you can actually use at your home have gotten so much cheaper. 
Um, so it's less attractive now to really look to that other kind of micro wind, um, something, like that, something like that for your home. And then also the question of, should you guys look at wind for your community? Um, it's always an option, like you said, but I think that you guys will run some issues with the topography. Um, and like you said there, and then also a lot of developers for something like that, they're gonna wanna do like a larger wind farm, maybe not just like one or two big turbines. So I think then when you guys start to look at something like that as a town, um, you may say, we, we, we're not going to want that here. Um, so I think that's the issue with wind there. Yeah. So if so it does Kirk come up though, definitely feel free to reach out about wind too. And, and after this, I, some of the slides had our website on there. I think it's just iserta.ny.gov forward slash siting. Fairly easy and, and poke, poke around at some of the resources. It might get the juices flowing. All right. Um, Kurt, Kirsten did that. I, I, again, I, I want to reiterate, first of all, I appreciate the question. Second of all, we should never take anything off the table because you never know, but did, did that help inform a, some, some, a little bit of the challenges with, with wind that we might need to address? Yes, it did. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Sure. Debbie, I see that you've joined us. Uh, thank you. I apologize for the, for the lag there and getting you back in. Um, did you have a question or is George still interested in um, pursuing? Did you have a, George, a question, Jordy? Was no. Just, no, I think he... No, I think we're, we're finished there. Okay. Thank you, though. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, other questions, follow-up, um, other ideas to explore? All right. Um, well, uh, Jen, Adam, Bill, uh, I'd like to thank all three of you for taking the time to be with us tonight. Um, also, Jen, I want to really thank you for your, your very prompt response to my inquiry and, and your willingness to be here and, and also to invite your colleagues, too, because not only did you get thrown under the bus, but you dragged them with you. So um, I, I appreciate that very much. It's always good to hear what, what the questions and issues are. So it helps no, this us is great. on both ends. And, and I'll, send really you a, I'll send you a PDF of the presentation after this. So feel free to email it around to the group. And I'd also like to ask you um, if you could send me two print copies of the um, battery guidelines and the wind guidelines. I have the solar guidelines already from a workshop uh, I attended. Um, but if you have, if, if you'd be willing to mail me any print copies, I'll follow up with you. And the, and the other copy I'll give to George. So, um, Deb, you can pass that on if um, he has. Okay. Yep. Um, so uh, thank the you. print copies might be a little bit tricky right now because we're not going to the office at all, but I can shoot uh, a note over to the facility staff that might be there. And I believe we still have a couple boxes of them, but it's been so many months. I honestly can't remember. Sure. Well, appreciate it. If you, if you can, that would be great. Um, both for George to have as a reference and, and me as well, please. If possible. And also, yep. Paul, thank you for all the interest here. It's, it's great to see someone in the North Country um, taking this initiative. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and the final thing I want to say is, you know, I've, I've been working with NYSERDA for about 20 years in, in one capacity or another at different times. And I've always had a very good relationship with NYSERDA. And when I was speaking recently to someone saying that I was going to try and invite you to speak to our meeting, to join our meeting, their comment was like, yeah, well, good luck finding anybody in NYSERDA because it's such a big behemoth that you're never going to connect it. And I'm telling you, within five minutes, uh, I had, uh, I think it was Frank on the phone and within a day I had you. So I, I really appreciate that, you know, once again, you guys have, have demonstrated that NYSERDA is completely engaged. And as you've been saying many times, you guys have been working every day um, throughout uh, this entire disruption we've been going through. So just really appreciate the energy and the work you guys are doing. Mm, pun intended. You. Yeah, that's Energy. a good one, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. I, we, we try, we try. I mean, sometimes things fall through the crack and maybe even people and emails right. fall through the crack, but we do try right. some. Thank you for Absolutely. recognizing that. Absolutely, we appreciate it. Um, so, uh, NYSERDA team, if you guys want to stay on, you're welcome to. Uh, and uh, comprehensive plan crew, let's, uh, let's take the next uh, 20 minutes or so and talk about next steps for us in our next meetings. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. I think I might sign off for now, unless you think there would be a benefit to us staying on. I, not unless it's purely, you know, uh, wanting to watch the train wreck or, or the fly on the wall. <laughs> uh, I think you guys are, you guys have done more than enough by being here for as long as you have. So thank you. Thank right. you. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs> All right, so um, last meeting, uh, we talked about what we were gonna be doing for scheduling future meetings. Um, this has been 
uh, getting meetings done in July, and this is only the first one, but the last meeting in June, this meeting tonight there, um, it's difficult for me to pull these off. So um, I would like to ask a couple of questions. One, what do we want to talk about next? I know uh, we had brought up, uh, Wes, I think you'd brought up diversity last time. We certainly can dive into that. Um, there are other, I think there are other topics that we want to explore. <coughs> so I'd like to get a sense from the committee of where we'd like to go next. And that will dictate whether um, I am going to try and find a speaker or whether we're going to go on hiatus until, um, until August 15th. Um, so I just need to get a sense, Debbie? You know, um, you just mentioned diversity. This might be a good time to um, to explore it and contact um, Ms. Hilton in Saran. Actually, I was going to say in Saranac Lake, but she just moved out of Saranac Lake. Yeah, it's it's Patterson. Um, yeah, Hilton Patterson mm -hmm. to um, perhaps speak to us. I see this as a huge issue coming up. So and, um, you know. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I, I was just I, saying, it might be nice to get in front of it instead of behind it. Uh, so diversity is a is a obviously is a is a complex ball, and I think it's something that we need to explore a little bit on our own before we invite Nikki to join us. Um, so uh, I would like to do one thing quickly, uh, and that is. Um, ask if other people uh, would, um, if other people have, be before we, sorry, I got distracted by something and I apologize for that. Um, before we get further into the conversation about diversity, um, that is one topic. Do people have other topics that they would like us to dive into? Um, so things that we have mentioned being priorities but haven't explored yet. So, uh, relationship with DEC um, and recreational lands and prioritizing something around recreation. Um, are there other conversations, uh, topics that people want to explore? I would like to see us at some point do a summary on all the different conversations we've touched on and try to prioritize those subjects and how we feel about them in the plan. Um, so, and we've touched on a lot of different subjects. Yeah, agreed. So we've 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 begun. I, I as you know, um, I have not been in a position to write up any of our recent conversations. We have written up a number of things through, I don't know what it was, March maybe that I sent the, uh, the document around. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I, I, Mary, obviously, so, so I mean, I'm, perhaps I'm not understanding and, I'm, and I wanna make sure that I'm not misunderstanding. Are you asking, do we, are you asking please to catch up on everything we've talked about or are you saying that we wanna do a reprioritization we did well, I, I guess what I'm saying is we've talked to a lot of different uh, subjects and um, if we can do a review of those and understand where they stand in our mind and the comp plan before we start going out to other places and adding more to, um, <coughs> am I making sense at all? Uh, I'm not tracking you, only because um, I'm trying to reconcile what we've done with what you're suggesting. So we have the prioritization um, survey that I sent around. I can send that back around. Is that, are you, are you asking that we reevaluate what things are priorities right now, or are you just asking for a synthesis of everything we've talked about on every just subject? Just a synthesis of everything that we've talked about as a subject. All right, so my starting point would be to encourage you to look at what I sent around in March. Because mm -hmm. that's the most that's the most recent synthesis, right. and since then I think we've largely talked. I think it's large since then. I think it's largely been um, forest, uh, forest forestry and yes, and solar. Um, mm -hmm. Well, renewable energy. Um, I think there's more to explore in renewable energy too. By the way, but that's a separate issue. Um, 
So yeah, Mary, I'm just not in a place right now where I can write. Oh, I understand that. I was meaning that as a group, not on you. Sure. I mean, if uh, I, I, so let's, let's take that suggestion and run with it for a minute. Um, if anybody wants to, we can create a Google document and I can put in headers and people can start just dumping their personal notes in if you want to do that and just try and collect a, you know, a general notes on, on, on those subjects. Was that get to what you might be looking at for Mary? I was just looking at a, at a general verbal group conversation on it. Is everybody, oh. we've covered so many subjects. Is everybody comfortable where we are and felt that we've done enough before we start grouping out into other subjects, Generalized. other areas. I think that's a good idea. I think Did Mary? A lot of information. And I've only been here for two minutes. Maybe. Um, so hold on. Thank you, Kirsten. I got you. Lorraine, are you adding something? Lorraine and Wes, are no, you adding something? Just listening. Okay. Um, so, all right, Mary, so, so now I, um, I might be gathering more. You're saying verbally, just let's have a conversation right verbally, now. Verbally, a group conversation, maybe now or, or at another time, just to kind of go over the highlights that we've talked about. Um, so we all have a general idea of what we're all thinking is important here before we start adding on more and losing something that was discussed a while ago. That's all. Okay, so, so two things, and, and again, I, I, um, I, I want to be clear, on the losing part, um, you know, we're, we're hopefully everybody's taking notes. Uh, we have the, the presentations recorded, so hopefully mm -hmm. no one's losing anything. Um, but I, didn't, I, I didn't like physically lose. I'm just, we've covered a lot of subjects. I, understood. Um, so what I'm, what I'm hearing, so I was just responding to the, you know, before we start losing yeah. things, I, hopefully no one's losing anything because, and I meant that not literally, I meant that figuratively, hopefully people are tracking things because they're taking notes. Um, but it, I, I certainly think we have 30 minutes. Let's, if you want to do this, let's dive in and let's talk about, um, talk about, re let's review and figure out what people think about, uh, both forest, uh, the forest economy conversation and the solar conversation. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Do you want to go back and review uh, from the point that we started Zoom uh, meetings? Uh, if, if I'm the only one who really feels this need, that's fine. We can go on to something else. No, I... I, I, I you know, I don't want to make the group waste time in something that I was thinking of. No, uh, and, and Wes, I, I see you've had your hand up. Um, uh, Kirsten said it would be beneficial. She's brand new, obviously, so she has an enormous amount of catching up to do. Um, Debbie, I don't know that yeah, we I've answered. Yeah, I've got my you. notes. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got, Barbara, are you talking to us? You are on mute. And then Wes, I'll come to you. Barbara. Barbara, are you talking to us? I think you're on mute. I'm on mute. There, there you I go. Am. Okay. I was just wondering, you know, we started out with some of the other, uh, we did have speakers for the uh, wood products as well as for the uh, solar structure, but we also had talked about uh, housing, you know, what were we going to do? I mean, are we going to pursue that? We were going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, what was some of the, I'd have to look at my notes to find out some of the other ones, but there were some other softer things that we had talked about early on that maybe we need to uh, see if we can synthesize that just to uh, see where that fits in to the priority list. All right, so again, here's, here's, what, I'd, here's what I'd like to do, and, and, I, and I, I, I think Mary's question is well-intentioned. I want to, before we go down this road, I would like to ask everybody to please review the document that I sent yeah. to Mark. Because there is an enormous amount of stuff synthesized in that document that reflects consensus decision making of this group. Yeah. So please read that. Once right. we've read that, let's pick up this conversation from there and talk about how we feel about this, the subsequent conversations that we've covered since then. And I just need to really reiterate, and I'm going to be 
just as blunt as I can be, I'm working three jobs and about 18 hours a day. I am not in a position to resynthesize things right now. I will do that as soon as I can, um, but that's not gonna be before August 15th. So in terms of writing something up, if people wanna see a synthesis, I am not in a position to do that. I cannot- Oh, that wasn't my intent at all. That was that we would take care of that, Paul. Right. right, and so I'll reiterate what I offered a moment ago. I'm happy to create a Google document I can put in those headers and then people can put their notes in there. Sounds good. Wes, thank you for being patient. What were you going to say? I think we've already done this. <laughs> and, and I'm puzzled as to the, the context of the conversation. In my mind, the only thing that's outstanding um, that needs further discussion and then um, going back to the prioritization that we have already put in place is the elevator pitch. Correct, we have not and, revisited and that. So I, I think that we have addressed all these issues. Yes, they need to be revisited to determine um, the mechanics as to how you put diversity into your marketing and your communication message, um, how you incorporate the wood products industry, the need for truck drivers into your housing plan. Um, you know, th those are the mechanical aspects that we need to do next. But in my mind, we have already set the higher level objectives and prioritized them as well. And so now we get into the mechanics of, of um, how are we going to accomplish those objectives? So I, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled. Well, I think, I think, and Debbie, I see that you want to say something. Um, I think, again, I think Mary's question is a good one, but I think before we dive into it today without organization or thought, I think let's all revisit that document. Let's figure out where our questions are. Let's figure out what has changed. And then we can, we can, we can take this conversation up with some, with some focus, um, I think, and, and, and some ref having refreshed uh, our thoughts. Debbie, what were you going to add? Well, I, I mean, I, I understand Mary's question, and it's a really good one. I think maybe it's been misinterpreted here, but maybe this is the time, because we have gone over a tremendous amount of um, content. So maybe this is the time that we break off into subsets and somebody decides, you know, or, a couple of people decide, okay, we're going to work on housing, you know, and bring that to the table. Um, energy, bring that to the table. You know, maybe, maybe we're getting to that point because all of us can't work on all, everything at one time. Um, you know, that's, that's a, a hard thing to, to do. And like you said, you're extremely busy um, and we don't want to have things get lost along the way because we do have a tremendous amount of great information here. And, you know, even though I take copious notes, I am afraid of, of forgetting something or, you know, um, maybe I see something in a different way. So, I don't know, my suggestion is maybe this is the time when we, when we do break into those work groups. So, to make sure, if, it's a, that's a fine idea. Um, to make sure that that work effort and time is expended efficiently and appropriately, when you say work on ideas, what do you mean? Because I, I want to reiterate that the comprehensive plan is not about is not about outlining the solutions. It is about outlining the goals towards which our town wants to work, and then subsequently the town can then figure out what the best steps and i say the town recognizing this conversation you know that we we recognize it's i guess wind. i i guess i'm kind of feeling that we're zeroing in on those goals and that was the time when we set those goals great okay so i i, I think that's great if people want to we can i'll tell you what else I'll, we can get into this google document um i will put a work group um a subgroup or i don't know whatever however you want to associate it um, and people can just put their names in the Google document um, under the topics that they want to explore more and come up with, again, with goals or suggestions. Um, before we do this, I really want to encourage people to reread the document that I sent in March. 
and um, and then uh, and then we can, uh, Debbie, to your point, people can self-select what topics they want to explore, um, and we can go from there. In terms of in terms of the diversity question, and and Mary again, um, appreciating your point, I'm not necessarily asking to dive into a new question tonight. But the way that I keep this committee meetings going and productive is that I'm trying to stay one subject ahead of the group. So I can line up speakers, I can line up conversations and we can do our work. So I'm asking in, in was where do we wanna go next? And if, and if next is actually let's take a break and let's refresh all our memory on all of the things that we've done and figure out are there gaps as Debbie and Mary are both saying, have we lost anything? Um, let's make sure that we haven't. So um, am I hearing consensus that we don't get a new speaker and our next meeting, we just try and, and reconsider where we are and make sure we haven't, we're, we're not losing sight of anything? And given especially how busy you are to put that extra burden on you, maybe it's just time for us to have a Google meeting among ourselves and go over everything. No. No? No. Um, um. It wasn't, no, I think Mary, what you were saying is good. And I think we knew, need to regroup to see if we wanna revisit things. But I think that it would be beneficial, I think to reprioritize that list that we had back in March. And I would, I'm really curious about what our elevator speeches were. And I think that could give us direction. The, sure, I can, I can send all that around. Actually, I, thought I sent the elevator speeches around no. and we never talked about them. No, no. no. I'll send that tonight. No, but that, that could be really, um, that could be good for us to see. But I agree, Mary, with regrouping and seeing if we want to um, call back these people and ask follow-up questions. And, um, but I think we need to do that. Um, kind of regroup. I think that's a good idea, especially since Paul is so busy right now. But I just want to go back to something else Paul said when you were talking as a, about another possible topic being our relationship with the DEC. And that seems like a, a, a good uh, question for us to look at also, right? Newcom and DEC. So that's another thing to keep. On. That's another thing. I, I keep losing my, my line. That's another thing to keep on the uh, future burner. Yep. Barbara? I've certainly changed my priorities since we started back there in February, March, or whatever. And that's why I wouldn't mind hearing from DEC and so forth, because every time I hear another speaker, I have reorganized myself again. So I'm all for gathering more information. And uh, uh, if, if it's possible without a lot of work for you to get us a speaker, that I would be just as willing to listen to somebody's one more point. So speakers are the easiest thing for me to line up um, for meetings right now. Um, doing the work of writing things up from my notes is, um, is just, a, that's just fundamentally not happening. Yeah. Um, so. The, yes, Wes. No, I was uh, waving to your, your daughter. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's our <laughs> trolling, trolling in the window behind me. So let's have a speaker so you we can take you off from doing anything, Paul, with setting well, up something. I want to be clear, though. Mary, is, what I'm hearing from Mary, Mary, and Kirsten is that, and Debbie, is that actually perhaps um, it might be productive to, to take some time to reflect on things. Uh, I'm happy to um, send around the elevator, um, the elevator, collected elevator comments and the, um, and the prioritization sheet, and we can kind of run back through that and see if anybody's changed their, their thoughts. So it can happen. Oh, I know I have. Okay, so I'm, I'm happy, that's not a problem. I can send those things around. The elevator speech, I, I, I do wanna say one thing about that. Um, the intention of the elevator speech, to be clear, was to get us thinking about how we visualize Newcomb internally, and how we communicate about Newcomb externally. It was a focusing exercise is what that was. Um, I, don't, I don't want, well, whatever thoughts it stimulates, um, we'll get that around and see what you think. 
Um, Wes, are you holding your pen up or are you just moving? Yeah, I, I am. Um, you know, going back to the elevator pitch is, um, you know, I think we all took a different tack at that and probably came from a lot of um, oh, different avenues. And um, I, I think that we would benefit by sharing, you know, each of our thoughts on that not that any one of them in particular is the elevator speech, but collectively there are pieces there that could be welded together in order to make that impactful statement, <clears throat> which is um, engaging and energizing someone to listen to phase two of the pitch. Yep, no, no problem. Um, I want to ask quickly, the way that document is formatted is I have everybody's first initial and everybody's last initial um, after their, their statements. Do people want complete anonymity or do people, do people, are people fine with their initials after everything? Sorry. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm good. I'm fine. And I'm also, fine. okay, um, I, 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 I actually have to go back and look at it um, I think we had reasonably good response rate. We didn't get a massive response rate. So um, if you know you didn't respond yet, you're welcome to send me something and I'll get it in there. But um, I think this group largely responded as I'm looking at who's here. I think everybody submitted something. Um, by the way, one quick housekeeping question. Someone is showing up as iPhone, but I don't know who that is as a person. Not us. Yeah. I, We're I, Lorraine's iPad. Yeah, no, I can see you guys. I've got can Barbara. You see, can you see I'm me? I'm iPad. Um, I've got Barbara. I've got Beth. I've got um, Roy and Kirsten. I've got Denise. I've got Mary, both Marys, and I have yeah. Debbie. And then yeah. I have a little block that says iPhone. I'm not sure who that is. How do you get yourself, your face to show up? Turn your camera on. <laughs> Where's that? Oh. So, Bottom left side of your screen, when you roll your um, when you roll your cursor over the bottom of the screen, it should it should bring up your menu bar, activate your menu bar, and there should be start. Um, there's a little movie camera picture, and there's a microphone picture. And yeah, if you the whole time. oh okay, if you click on that, it should it should there you go. There she is. See now. There's Kirsten. We got Kirsten. I can't see me. <laughs> her picture's not there, but her icon is. Yeah. Anyway, so um, is, is there anybody here who's on on the phone as well as on the computer as well as on the computer? Is anybody called in alongside there? I think it might be Kevin because Kevin ah. was on. If that's what I wondered if it was ah, Kevin. Kevin Bolin. Brilliant. All right, good. So I'm going to put uh, I'm taking attendance. So that's good because I can add Kevin. Denise and Kevin. Brilliant. Got it. OK. Um, so uh, I've heard two different things. I've heard um, let's regroup and I've heard let's try and get um, a speaker. Get out. Um, so what do people want to do for what would be, would be July, July 22nd and uh, so July 22nd. Well, I tried to um, next proposed meeting. Oh, something just happened. Um, what happened? I, I like Mary uh, Monahan's idea of um, regrouping, like reprioritizing, and uh, taking advantage of uh, that. And Paul, you don't have to do any legwork on that. Is that correct? Marginally. Yep. Marginally. <laughs> So um, does anybody in this group not have the March document? I don't think I have it, Paul. Okay. So what I'm going to do at some point in the coming days is I will send around the March document. I will send around the prioritization table. I will send around the um, elevator, the elevator speeches. And um, we will, everybody will have the same stuff and we will then figure out from there when we're going to meet to talk about them next. 
That sounds great. And I appreciate you doing all that, Paul, because I know it's really a crazy time for you. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. And if it's easier later for you, Paul, if we're just going to get on a Zoom and chat around everything, if it's easier for you to join us later, that's, you know, I know how busy you are over the AIC. Um, um, it's not the AIC. The AIC is closed. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, yes. Um, okay. Other things that we want to, uh, I'm putting on the, on, the, on the table for now, tabled for now, um, but future speakers would be, future conversations uh, are what we want to do about prioritizing uh, Newcomb in terms of recreational investment by the state and a conversation about diversity. So those are internal conversations. Once we have them, we can then uh, align those with external speakers, if and as appropriate. So those are, the, those are the next two topics that I have. Are there other topics that people feel we need to be planning? All right. Um, other observations, comments in the remaining 10 minutes? Or you can go eat supper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At this point, it's uh, yeah. Um, other uh, anything else that uh, yep. people have? Okay. All right. Thank you all for being here. I was actually a little surprised um, about the presentation tonight, so that was kind of an interesting experience. Um, and uh, I'll get those documents out. Please uh, send um, questions and comments as you have them. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you, Paul. Thanks, Paul. See you, everybody. Thanks,